Hey there guys and welcome back to the Travis and Damien podcast episode 65. We are available on anchor.fm slash Travis Damien podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many more. If you guys like to ask us any questions, you can leave a voice message as message at the anchor link or in the YouTube comment section. Today we're gonna to be talking about general gaming news, including Nintendo, PlayStation, and Sonic. And then we're gonna go into our recent activities, including anime and some other gaming stuff. Next, we're going to talk about the Demon Slayer Mugen Train movie. After that is going to be the Loki episode three and four discussion. Lastly, our thoughts on Mario Golf Super Rush. So first piece of news is that Doug Bowser, he had some comments relating to the Switch Pro rumors. So there was a article, I believe, on uh, Wall Street, uh, not Wall Street, Washington Post. Uh, and he pretty much said that like Nintendo doesn't view a Switch Pro necessary right now because it doesn't enhance gameplay or they don't view it as a way to enhance gameplay right now. So they just don't see a reason to release a Switch Pro, which I can see what he's saying because in my opinion, when it comes to like the PS4 Pro and like whatever the enhanced Xbox was last generation, I didn't see a reason to really upgrade to those because it was just like prettier graphics and like that was really about it because the PS4 could still handle most, if not all of the other games that were coming out at the time. I just want like better frames because <laughs> like <laughs> nintendo like the switch is like very weak right now like we've said before mm-hmm. and like it could barely handle 30 frames for a lot of games you know i, I actually would wouldn't mind like a switch pro at this point i think that's why a lot of people want a switch pro because like, it doesn't even have to be 60 frames at this point i'm okay which is a stable 30 but like most games can't even do that so um you know i hope they actually release something soon i mean this Kind of makes it so like the rumors for the Switch Pro might be something bigger now. Like it might just be a Switch 2 or something. Mm-hmm. I, I don't, you know, no one knows. No one knows anything because you know, this has been rumored forever. But um, at this point, I think they might be pushing for a Switch 2 or like, I don't know. It's kind of hard. Cause I, I don't think they want to do Switch 2 because they'd be afraid of like a Wii U situation where, you know, mm-hmm. people thought that the Wii U was just like some weird like add on to the Wii. So like no one bought it. Uh, So I don't know if they want to just call it a Switch 2 or whatever. But, um, you know, I think Nintendo is really treading lightly with their consoles you know they they put the switch out just so they could save themselves from the wii u and it worked really well but i think now they're kind of scared to do like a sequel console because it might just end up like the wii u at least that's that's always been my theory on why they haven't been like showing like any new hardware besides like you know the switch Lite. Mm-hmm. Uh, but hopefully we do get something more powerful because i think I, I would like perform it. <laughs> I think that enhances the <laughs> gameplay experience by a lot. Like it doesn't have to look like, you know, like Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart or something. Like I'm just, I'm totally good with just having like good frame rates and a better resolution as well. Like maybe some HDR support. You know, just some like things that are pretty standard nowadays. That that's all I ask for. <laughs> Yeah, so, I can yeah. definitely see what you're saying because you play a lot more Switch games than me and, and you probably experience a lot more games uh, probably with like the Dynasty Warrior like games where like yeah. it's just chugging. Ran, like, ass. Yeah. <laughs> it's just chugging, but you know, they don't view that as guess like pure gameplay stuff, which like performance really does uh, hinder the gameplay itself because if you have bugs or like if the game's just running poorly it's not gonna be a fun time when you're playing it obviously so i think that i can understand that people like you know really do want it and i can get behind your theory with them being like very hesitant on releasing a switch upgrade or even like a sort of like wii u equivalent you know like just like a sequel console whether it be a new nintendo switch you know because they're really bad with name schemes uh or whatever they call it next uh i'm sure that like they are very careful and like you said treading lightly because you know last time they went from the wii to the wii u it was really bad so i'm sure that now because they are riding this high of the switch for i believe like five years now uh they're making sure that like whatever they do next they're able to you know probably backwards compatibility with the switch games and on top of that keep it in line with i guess the switch family yeah um again it it just depends on what they're gonna do like they're probably not gonna advertise it as like a full-on like you know next generation of switch it might just be like a like oh you could buy this if you want but the switch could still run this like i think that's what they're gonna try to do Mm -hmm. to keep everyone happy but um i guess we won't know at least for like another like two years or a year from now i don't know like they're gonna have to upgrade soon because the switch is getting pretty old at this point um you know this is the time in these consoles lifespans where they usually have like a pro version so mm-hmm. oh, we're just gonna have to wait and see because you know the switch has obviously been selling really well and i, I nintendo really doesn't want to mess with that right now but 
it would be nice to see an upgrade so like games don't run like shit <laughs> mm-hmm. like this is a, like you know I, I would like to play more things on my switch but like if the performance is bad i'll just get it on pc or like on a playstation console instead because i don't want to deal with that anymore like there's no reason to really like, i don't really use the switch portably too much anyway like i kind of mm-hmm. just keep it docked most of the time so um, i'm not really getting any benefit from like the drawbacks from the lack of power so yeah, I, I guess it just depends on what Nintendo wants to do. If they want to do, like, a stronger, you know, hardware, but not, like, you know, a full-on sequel to the Switch, then I guess they'll do that. But it's really unclear what they want to do right now. So, <laughs> Yeah, that was definitely, like, a huge, like, selling point for me personally when it came to, like, third-party titles. It's like, oh, you know, like, I could take it on the go, theoretically, but, like, performance is obviously, like, a very key thing when it comes to switch ports especially since most of them uh don't run as well as the console equivalent or even on pc obviously so you know uh a switch pro wouldn't be that bad now especially if it does enhance performance but you know they just don't view it as a top priority right now Mm -hmm. but uh more we have more switch news here uh the smash Bros. ultimate kazuya uh showcase uh you know the show that uh, and Sakurai basically said he has, he said some pretty interesting uh, things during this like sort of uh, showcase. Mm-hmm. Um, but first up, you know, they showed all his moves. You know, he has a ton of moves. I forget how many, but I think like uh, instead of having like four directions, he could do like eight directions of moves. So it's like you have up, left, right, and down, but you also have like you know the other directions as well, like in between. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, he has just a ton of different moves and stuff. You know, obviously he could probably do some really crazy. I haven't seen any like combo videos or anything, but um. Like, sort of the sample combos that Sakurai was showing were, like, pretty insane. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know how much damage this dude is going to do, uh, but if he can do a lot of damage and have that much combo potential, it seems like he's going to be really busted. But, again, I don't really know. Um, usually, the way they balance these fighting game characters is that their recoveries are, like, really bad. But it doesn't look like his is that bad. His up B seems pretty good. So, and I think his, his double jump goes pretty far as well, so... Um, I, can't, I, I don't know. I'm not a Smash expert, but I, I guess I'll keep my, my ears to the ground to see what people are feeling about him. <laughs> but he looks pretty fun. I, I haven't had a chance to actually play him yet, but um, he has some pretty interesting mechanics. I, he has like a, like a, what do you call it, a comeback mechanic, though. I think when you get a, a 100%, you could do like a big move or something. I forget. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, you could do like a grab or something and does like a shit ton of damage. So I don't know how people feel about that. I know people really don't like comeback mechanics in this game, but mm-hmm. he has one. He also has like a pretty good projectile too with his uh, laser from what Sakurai was showing. Um, so yeah, he definitely looks like he covers more bases than the other, uh, I guess, fighting game characters in Smash. Uh, like he looks a lot more versatile than they do. Um, but yeah, he looks pretty fun. Uh, you know, there was a lot of... Um, I guess like uproar with some of the me costumes they showed during this presentation. You know, they showed the the Dova King from Skyrim, so like Skyrim man. But then they showed Dante and Shante, and people got really upset about that because people really wanted them in the game. But you know, at this point, if they show up as a me costume, probably ain't gonna happen. Uh, I think Shante gets some music, so that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah. Besides that, that's basically all he showed. And then at the end of the showcase, Sakurai basically just said, "Yeah, this is like there's only one more character, and I'm not doing any more, so don't ask." <laughs> so it really does seem like this is gonna be like you know obviously the last fighter pass, which a lot of people thought, you know. But um, mm-hmm. you know, we don't know if Sakurai is really gonna be continuing with Smash after this game in general. You know, obviously it's too early to say. Maybe he does want to do the next Smash, but he said he's been working on Smash for like ten years straight because of um Smash Four and then Smash Ultimate. So. You know, it would be pretty reasonable for him to take, like, a break at this point from Smash Brothers. Um, so it's going to be pretty interesting to see what the next Smash game is. Obviously, he's not going to have the same amount of characters as Ultimate does, because, you know, even Sakurai himself said this was, like, a nightmare for licensing. So um, I don't know if they're going to totally change the formula for the next Smash game or what, but it's going to be very interesting to see um, what the next Smash game will look like at this point, because there's really nothing else you could do with this game besides add more people. <laughs> and maybe they might do another Fighter Pass in the future. Like Maybe they might, like, for the next console, they might do a uh, Mario Kart 8 thing, where it's just like, all right, here's just Smash Ultimate again, and we work in the next one later. Uh, because a lot of people are going to be upset when all their characters are, like, cut from the game. So, yeah, it's uh, very weird times for the Smash, like, I guess, community. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, Kazuya as just, like, a character. I mean, anytime, or, like, this entire pack in general and, like, the previous one included, like, whenever there's a third-party character included, you know, Sakurai always makes sure that, like, the moveset always stays true to the the original game that they're from, whether for better or for worse. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that for this one, you know, him having so many different moves and so many different uh, sort of combos and, like, a bunch of different things going on with him, I think makes him very interesting and i think that uh he will 
you know, see some competitive play probably early on because, you know, he's still relatively new. I'm not even sure if he's been out for a week yet. Um, but yeah, I mean, just from what I saw of Kazuya and just like in general, like with Sakurai in this showcase, he was having a lot of fun with it. So I can tell that, you know, he, he definitely had a lot of fun and enjoyment bringing this character into Smash, especially with Tekken as such a huge property and such a huge IP as it is, you know, uh, Smash Twitter, some of them will say differently, but they're dumb and they don't know anything besides Smash Brothers. Um, but yeah, I think that Kazuya, once again, Sakurai nailed it on the head in terms of like making this character, you know, a Tekken character in Smash. So I think that that was very good. Uh, the me costumes, you know, I think that the Skyrim guy was definitely out of nowhere. That was funny. <laughs> um, but Dante, I saw one reaction video on Twitter with some guy who was just like freaking out that like, no, like, oh my God, you know, like obviously yeah. <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna peek my mic here, but you know, like my man's, my man's just upset and rightfully so, but you know, it is what it is. At least he's in the game in some way, shape or form. At least Sakurai knows that there was demand for it. It's just that, you know, there is only one point or one character left that he wants to make for this game. So, you know, obviously people are going to get cut and we don't know who the last fighter is. And like you were saying with the whole, uh, you know, what's going to happen for Smash after this. I'm sure that the game's going to be somewhat stagnant for a bit and people are going to figure out, like I guess, like a meta and figure out who's good and who's bad. There was probably going to be a couple patches here and there between now and the next Smash game, whatever the hell that happens. Um, but, you know, Sakurai has been literally doing Smash Brothers straight for a long, long time, and I'm interested to see what he can do outside of Smash because I think the last thing he did outside of Smash was Kid Icarus. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, it was Kid Icarus. Yeah. So... Kid Icarus Uprising was definitely one of the better 3DS games. It it had a lot going for it. It definitely was doing some things differently. You know, I think that many people who have played that game can agree that, you know, hand pains are definitely part of it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, whatever he does next, I am interested to see because, you know, Sakurai, he knows about game design. And he touched on that, like you said, with something like interesting, some interesting stuff that he touched on was like fighting games. And, you know, he, he wasn't trying to argue whether Smash Brothers was a fighting game or not, which I think was a very good point for him to make because, you know, people would have definitely taken that angle and ran it with it on Twitter and the internet in general. But, you know, him just, you know, making that argument between Tekken and Smash Brothers and all that other stuff I thought was interesting from his perspective because he is the goddamn, you know, developer of uh, Smash Brothers at the end of the day. So, um, but yeah, you know, overall, I think that this showcase is, uh, you know, pretty good. And I'm excited to see how Kazuya fits within the Smash meta and, you know, Smash Brothers in general and whatever the hell happens next for Smash Brothers, because this as a IP and sort of as a franchise at this point has, you know, always been exciting for Nintendo fans and even people outside of Nintendo to, you know, see who ends up in Smash next. So, yeah, so it's going it's to be weird to like move on from all these announcements until the next Smash game, but that's kind of where we're at right now. You know, there's not much else with Ultimate you could do at this point. So, you know, I mean, it's been writing, you know, for like what, since 2018 at this point. So I guess it's pretty fair for it to finally come to an end because it's been, it's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so next bit of news is that House Marquee. I hope I said that right. Uh, I think it's just House Mark. House Mark, cool. All right, yeah. House Mark. They joined the PlayStation Studios. Uh, so they are the people that developed Re Returnal, some yeah. other titles that I am not too familiar with. But hey, it looks like Returnal did well enough for PlayStation to be like, hey, we're just gonna buy you, so you can make more games just for us. So, um, yeah, this is very exciting, and that just means that you know, they are able to create more interesting and more uh, creative games because I think that uh, having studios like this one that created a uh, sort of roguelike, a triple A roguelike game like this one uh, really does show like, I guess there are people within the industry that still want to create new and interesting ideas. Um, and I'm glad that PlayStation were able to, I guess, you know, buy them and I guess support them in whatever future games that they decide to create. Yeah, it's actually pretty exciting as well because I, I really liked Returnal. I thought it was a great, like, sort of, again, 3D, I'm not 3D, um, AAA roguelite, uh, you know, like that hasn't really been attempted before. Because, uh, you know, roguelite as a genre is very popular, but, you know, no, no AAA developer has really tried to do it before. So, and I think um, 
Housemark really did a good job with it. Obviously, there were some issues like when the game came out. It was like a lot of bugs and some other things. But you know, they're, they're still a smaller <laughs> studio, even though they have you know the, the backings of Sony. So um, for their first real attempt, I like a triple A game. They, they did a great job, I think. You know, there's a lot of other indie game, uh, indie developers that get given a bunch of money and be told to make a triple A game like Godfall, and they end up falling flat. So I'm happy that Housemark was able to pull it off pretty well. Um, and I'm honestly really excited for the next game. Hopefully it's just as action-packed as Returnal. I don't know if they're going to do DLC for Returnal. I actually not, have no idea if they, they will do that. But, you know, obviously Returnal does fit for uh, some DLC as well, since roguelites are pretty easy to just keep expanding upon. Um, so, yeah, I'm very excited for this. You know, I think their gameplay is a, a good fit for Sony. I think Sony doesn't really have a lot of really cool or fun sort of arcade type games like this, where it's more focused on the gameplay than anything else. You know, Sony games are usually more focused on narrative and stuff. So it's going to be good to have a, a what you call it, developer focus on, you know, more action and just pure gameplay like Housemark is. So, yeah, I, th- I think it's a pretty good fit. And, you know, we can see Sony starting to uh, broaden their horizons. They've been buying a lot of studios lately. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see, like, what the PS5 is going to have uh, in its later years since, you know, we're pretty used to all the big Sony studios now, like Santa Monica, mm-hmm. Sony Act, Naughty Dog, and Sucker Punch and the like. So it's going to be nice to have some new blood and maybe get some even, you know, new IPs in here. Because uh, last gen we had uh, Horizon, which is a great addition to the PlayStation family. So I'm very excited to see uh, what other IPs they could do or maybe Return of 2. I don't know. <laughs> but it's going to be exciting either way. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Uh, and speaking of more Sony news, uh, Ghost of Tsushima Director's Cut was also announced uh, it, out of nowhere. I mean, I, I, people were kind of <laughs> suspecting this would be a thing, yeah. but it seems to have more uh, effort put into it than I thought it was going to. So um, it's going to be coming to PS4 and PS5 on August 20th. Uh, obviously, it's PS5 features are going to feature like 4K resolution, adaptive tri- triggers and stuff. And uh, the new exciting stuff is a new island and story is also going to be added. So basically like an expansion, mm-hmm. uh, which I think you can only play on PS5. I'm not too sure, actually. <laughs> Uh, I believe it's only on PS5. I believe right? the director's cut, just in general, might uh-huh. be might include everything. But uh, okay, pretty sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so, it says on both platforms it'll support okay. the new Iki Island content. So yeah, because the blog post was a little weird. So yeah, we have mm-hmm. the pricing structure here. So if you're going from the PS4 to the PS4 director's cut version, that'll be twenty bucks to upgrade it. If you're going from the PS4 Directors Cut to just the PS5, like no, I guess like no other features, it's just like the PS5 performance, it's gonna be ten bucks. And then from PS4 to PS5, which is basically what everyone's gonna do, is gonna be thirty bucks, um, which is a bit. I mean, it depends on how much content is in this new stuff because you know people were complaining about the Final Fantasy VII stuff where it was twenty bucks to upgrade it. Mm-hmm. All right, it was free to upgrade, but it was twenty bucks for like the uh, Yuffie stuff, um, and this is like an additional ten dollars. So. Uh, it really just depends on how big the content. I mean, I love Ghost of Tsushima, so I'm going to buy it anyway. But um, I know some people were kind of throwing a stink about how much it is. And I, I do kind of agree. I think 20 bucks probably would have been a bit better. But again, I don't know the scope of the content yet. So I guess I can't really say anything until I play it. Um, but yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a bit of a price <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> to really put it like that. But it's a first-party uh, Sony studio thing that so they know it's going to sell like crazy anyway. Ghost of Tsushima sold like crazy anyway, so Sony would be kind of weird not to capitalize on it. But yeah, I, c- I can see why people are a bit upset about the whole pricing structure. It's just a little confusing in general. Uh, yeah, I mean, as a uh, Sucker Punch simp, everything I'm going to say is going to be very biased, but you know, uh, I love Ghost of Tsushima. Uh, I-, I didn't 100% it just because of how big the game was and I had other things going on during that time. But um, I'm very excited to jump back into Ghost of Tsushima and even like even start over or maybe I'll transfer my save. I'm not exactly sure what I'll do when the game comes out on August 20th, but I am excited to see what Sucker Punch uh, has upgraded for this game. Uh, Not just with the whole performance, with the 4K resolution, adaptive triggers, but also with the new content that they added, because I think that. Uh, for me personally, I really like the story of Jin Sakai and sort of to see what else they could do after that. This is obviously going to be something very small, very, you know, minimal. You know, it's pretty much just like a side expansion to get people enticed to possibly upgrade and, you know, buy this new director's cut. Uh, me personally, I'm probably just going to, you know, spend the $70 and just buy it all over again and and have it physically because I want to support the studio and I want to support Sucker Punch and, you know, whatever future 
endeavors they may have. And yeah, I am just excited to jump back into the world of Ghost of Tsushima if that wasn't very obvious. But I think that the pricing structure, um, you know, there's obviously going to be very different prices between sort of upgrades. You know, obviously, if it's just like a straight like, you know, enhancement, just like performance stuff that should be free but if there's like other stuff on top of that like what you said with the final fantasy 7 remake you know like it was free but if you wanted like that extra content and stuff that was 20 bucks and i'm sure that that's what everyone wanted uh so you know square enix obviously knew that so they were like well you know we're gonna charge 20 that's probably fair i think maybe right i'm not entirely sure because i haven't played I, it i thought i think it was fair like at first i thought 20 was too much mm-hmm. but um after playing it i'm like oh yeah there was actually a lot more content than i thought so i thought 20 was pretty fair mm-hmm. so maybe 30 might be a little steep uh but you know this is obviously sony this is uh, playstation that we're talking about here i'm i'm not entirely sure if sucker punch really had a huge say in how much you know they could charge from the original ps4 to the you know straight up ps5 version um i'm sure it's because you know like sony uh they ran obviously like promotions and deals for ghost of tsushima on the ps4 and they were like well you know to possibly recoup some of that money if if they want the ps5 version now you know 30 dollars probably is a little high but you know if you're going to either go that route or you know just straight up buy the game all over again obviously this is the cheapest route that you can go so it's either that or you just don't play it on the ps5 pretty much so you know it is what it is. Uh, I'm sure that in due time, because the because this new console generation is still so new, we're gonna get to a point where there's gonna be a standardized sort of pricing of you know next gen upgrades with new content or not new content. So, you know, I think that Final Fantasy and Ghost of Tsushima are the two big notable ones. Every one else has been pretty much free for the upgrade. So, wait, didn't didn't you pay for Spider Man though? Uh, uh p- 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 possibly. I right, think the so. Maybe. For I can't uh, remember. <laughs> actually, I, I don't think that that was a upgrade at all. I think that that was just like a separate game. So like, if you had the PS4 version, you couldn't get the definitive edition. But maybe they, they maybe they changed that around. I can't exactly remember. But right. um, yeah, you know. Okay. Yeah, you're right. I think it was like a separate <laughs> game. Yeah, it was like a full on remaster and stuff like an upgrade i guess so yeah and yeah, people it's weird <laughs> it's people weird. were upset that there wasn't a sort of like free upgrade or any upgrade attached to it but maybe there might be an upgrade now i'm not entirely sure because you know insomniac games they are very much you know they will listen to what people say and they will try to take that into account and you know sort of play around that but yeah <laughs> Yeah, now we're getting ready to yep. talk about some Sonic. Okay, so let's talk about some Sonic news. So uh, the Sonic director, uh, Tagashi Izuka, hopefully I pronounced that right, uh, he, ho- he hopes that this new Sonic 2022 game will lay the foundation for future Sonic titles. So um, yeah, this is a very interesting interview that uh, Sonic Stadium had with him. Um, so pretty much the way that he views uh, this new Sonic game, which supposedly the title is Sonic Rangers, which I'm not sure how I feel about that, um, yeah. but I'll throw that back to you later. Um, he, he pretty much views this title because they've been working on it for quite a while. He views it as like the Sonic Adventure uh, equivalent for like future Sonic games, hopefully, where it sort of molds and shapes what other Sonic games in the future will be like. I'm not entirely sure if that is true, obviously, because these are just his words and we don't know anything about the game itself. Um, but yeah, I think that, you know, just that alone is very ambitious. And I think that um, whatever this new Sonic title entails, uh, is going to be uh, interesting, and I think that Sonic fans should be somewhat excited for it. Yeah, and also kind of like disproves the theory that's going to be like a like a boost game, maybe or like fully like a boost game. How the other games were, it seems it's going to be like a totally new thing. Because mm-hmm. um, I know some people were like worried that it would just keep going that direction. And I mean, I think it's good that they're sort of like laying the groundwork for like an actual like formula that could work for Sonic. Because obviously we know that Sonic changes his formula way too much. Um, you know, you got the adventure style games and then the boost stuff and maybe some other things on the side, like wherever Lost World was. So, um, you know, so there's been like a ton of different ways 3D Sonic has been. But I don't think any of them has been like sort of definitive. You know, I think the adventure games have some issues. Um, and like the boost games have some issues so i don't know if we actually arrived on a perfect formula but uh, i think the boost games kind of sort of reached their peak at that with like generations like, i felt like you couldn't really do much more uh mm-hmm. so i was pretty happy with them to just move on from that but it did forces instead so i guess not 
Um, so yeah, it's, it's gonna be interesting to see what they do. I don't even know how you even do like a Sonic like thing anymore, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I think if they just kept refining the adventure formula, I think we would have something really good. Like just get rid of all the other characters, just have Sonic, and just improve with his move set from there. Because you know, I think Adventure Two, like you had a good sense of speed while having some good platforming while like, the whole game going to a 2D section to do, like, its platforming stuff. Um, I think Colors is actually pretty bad with that, and now that I'm going to play that game again, I could probably reaffirm that once I actually do play it again. But uh, mm-hmm. I just remember there, there weren't really a lot of moments where you went fast. There was a lot of, like, really slow moments in Colors. I think Generation fixed that, but, um, yeah, it's, it's just it's going to be interesting to see what they actually do with this new game and see how what the gameplay loop is going to be like. Because I, I heard rumors it's going to be, like, open world and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of things being thrown around right now. I don't know how well that would work at all. Uh, but who knows? Maybe, like, a Sonic like Odyssey would work pretty well. I don't really know. But, um, again, hopefully it just finds a good spot to be in. Because Sonic has not been in a good spot for like a while <laughs> you know i think i think that's just the yeah, sonic fans are just you're kind of just used to that <laughs> mm-hmm. but um you know hopefully sonic can find something good and they actually do figure something out because i think sonic needs a good big break because generations came out like what like 10 years ago at this point it's yeah been a, like it's been a long time 11 yeah yeah <laughs> so like it's it's been a long time since that that's the last sonic game i would consider or i guess 3d sonic game i would consider like really really good mm-hmm. uh, obviously mania came out but that you know that's a 2d sonic game so yeah, so basically I'm just trying to say uh, hopefully they find something that actually works. <laughs> yeah, I think that an open world Sonic game would definitely be a, a huge right curve um, and something that I wouldn't expect personally. But if they were to go that route, it would be hopefully something akin to Sonic Adventure, but obviously expanded and a lot bigger. Um, but, you know, these are big words coming from, you know, the main guy behind this title in particular. So I hope that... You know, it does live up to those expectations. Obviously, whatever expectations you set for yourself after what he said is obviously up to you. Uh, me personally, you know, I'm just like, just show us some gameplay. Just actually show us what the game is about because the game is still like mid mid development, and we probably won't see anything for the game until next year, maybe at the end of this year. Who knows? Um, but yeah, I think that Sonic Rangers or whatever the hell this game is going to be called is uh, going to shape how Sonic is for the next couple of years 100 percent. or if it bombs they'll just find yeah. a new formula <laughs> <laughs> so it really depends like, it seems like they really do want to push like sonic into like, the limelight again with his 30th anniversary and stuff so again hopefully 3d sonic actually have a good place in like society because you know, <laughs> sonic has been 3d sonic has always been pretty contentious um speaking of that we have the sonic prime concept art uh, this was like the new netflix show right I yes believe. mm-hmm so um so they actually have new designs and they look pretty all right uh you know sonic has some weird looking shoes um <laughs> they, they kind of look like like the soap shoes a little bit from yeah. adventure 2 a bit um he has some weird gloves tails has like a vest i guess that that looks all right on him uh he has his shoes a little like metal and then uh we have eggman here you know eggman <laughs> I, I don't know about <laughs> eggman too much <laughs> Is that like there's like other Eggmans as well? Is that like the one from Rush? Yo, <laughs> like, bro, my man got children maybe or twins. Eggman verse. <laughs> who the hell knows? <laughs> yeah, so there's some pretty crazy things, especially with the Eggman stuff. Like I don't know if that's supposed to be like you know, I've got the grandfather's name for Eggman, but you know from Sonic Adventure too. But yeah, it seems like they're doing some pretty interesting stuff there. It looks like they're in like some cyberpunky type thing, like Eggman Land type style of like mm-hmm. place. So I could try to go for like a Saturday AM thing where Eggman already won or something, but um. Yeah, I'm not too sure. Uh, it could be interesting. I know we we still don't know too much about this show besides you know this concept art and whatever they talked about in the 30th anniversary stream. So, uh, it, hopefully it's good. <laughs> I, I didn't watch <laughs> Sonic Boom either. I, I mean, I heard Sonic, I seen like clips of Sonic Boom and it was pretty funny. But maybe they want to go for a more story focused one. You know, maybe they could do something pretty interesting. But again, not too sure yet. Uh, also, it's, it's supposed to be CG, right? Like. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be a CG. They might go for yeah. like a CG 2D look. Who knows? Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, when I first saw these, I was like, oh, okay. I like the colors. You know, Sonic still looks like Sonic, so that's good. Uh, his shoes are a interesting look. Um, you know, I think whenever 
Sonic's design gets changed up, the initial reaction is always like, why did you change it? But it's always like, in my eyes now, it's like, well, you know, they want to make it so that this is the Sonic from Sonic Prime, you know, like, so you know that this Sonic is from this specific version of Sonic, if you will, you know, Um, and Tails' redesign, you know, obviously it's not that huge either, you know, it's just the shoes and then the vest uh, to sort of, I guess, nail home that he's, you know, the brains and the mechanic behind you know team sonic or whatever um and you know sonic doing that Fortnite dance you know it is what yeah. it is uh that's <laughs> <Yep>. just <laughs> i ignored that <laughs> sonic sonic's just uh he he's very popular with the kids so you know him doing silly stuff like that i'm not gonna make too big of a deal about it because it is what it is um but the the different versions of eggman that is going to be a very interesting take um i'm not sure if these are his children or different versions of him or maybe he cloned himself or whatever the hell happened um but yeah and then there's some other concept art with like amy uh she she's like uh i don't even know i guess like george of the jungle kind of vibes with i don't know what's going on here but yeah uh whatever they do with this sonic show i am just I just want it to be good for both Sonic fans, but also good for kids because just because a show's made for kids, uh, not like toddlers or anything like that, but like a show that's made for like, you know, like actual like elementary school children, um, it could be good for kids, but also for adults as well. I mean, that's why the Pixar movies always do so good or most of the time they do so good. Um, right. So... You know, hopefully this sort of nails that home because I know that they were very much pushing that this is a show made for, you know, longtime fans of Sonic, but also new fans of Sonic. So, you know, hopefully they are able to achieve that with this show. Um, I noticed that the uh, the pirate flag in the last concept art, it looks like a echidna. So maybe that's where Knuckles comes from. You know, maybe Knuckles is a pirate. Who knows? Um, I'm sure that they're going to have a lot of fun with this with this show. And I hope that I can have a lot of fun watching it, too, when, whenever it comes to Netflix. So, yeah, it actually kind of looks like they're, they're doing a riff apart thing. And I'm sorry, like, <laughs> are these like different like dimensions or something? These are all like ultimate dimension Eggman's. Like, mm-hmm. kind of looks like that with the last screenshot with the portals and stuff. But um, yeah, I guess we'll, we'll find out when it actually comes out. Yeah. Uh, next thing we got here is the Demon Slayer game, uh, the Kino Kami Chronicles. Uh, so this is made by the same people, uh, Cyber Connect 2, who did the Naruto Ultimate Ninja Storm games, uh, which I have played pretty much all of them. Um, and they are making this one, and it is being published by Sega, and it looks really good. As a person who has, who is a huge Demon Slayer fan, you know, obviously I have watched season one one and a half times. I say one and a half because the half I was kind of just like, you know, it was just in the background or whatever. Um, but you know, I've read the manga. I am a huge fan of these characters and just by how this game looks, you know, cyber connect Two. once again, they really do put a lot of care and effort into their anime games. And, you know, as a person who experienced the Naruto series through their games, you know, how they're handling the, uh, demon slayer game, because I know the source material uh, for season one, obviously, uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. And also the gameplay, uh, if you look up gameplay of this game, it's, you know, a open arena 3D anime fighter. It's it's pretty much just Ultimate Ninja Storm, but with uh, Demon Slayer characters. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, it looks a lot better than I thought. You know, I was pretty disappointed when they first announced. I'm like, oh, a Demon Slayer game. Then they said, oh, it's going to be a arena fighter, like every other anime game, like, right, whatever. <laughs> and I sleep. But mm-hmm. then they showed the gameplay, and I'm like, oh, shit, that actually looks really good. Uh, obviously, I never experienced the, uh, the Ninja Storm games because I've never been a, a Naruto fan, really. Mm-hmm. But uh, it looks like they're putting a lot of effort into the adventure mode. Like, you know, the combat actually looks pretty fun. You fight, like, all the different demons and stuff. Like, it actually does look, like, a lot of fun. Like, the cutscenes look really nice. The game in general looks pretty nice, you know like the graphics wise looks pretty good um you know obviously we have you know i'm comparing this to the um the my hero game and you know that one doesn't look <laughs> nearly as good as this one you know that one's obviously a lot lower budget and has like no effort put into the story mode at all so i i wish like my hero got this treatment as well but like seeing uh demon Slayer get something like this is, is really nice and um if it's good i'll, I'll probably get it probably on sale though but yeah it, it does yeah. look pretty good uh, yeah it, it does look pretty good I, i'm happy they're putting a lot of effort into like the um story mode and stuff and, ho- and the multiplayer is probably gonna be a bunch of fun as well <laughs> you know it's gonna be 
it's gonna be like you know unbalanced and fun but that's why i like <laughs> these games right like that's why i love yeah. like the um the dragon ball z like tenkaichi games because they're just so like non-balanced at all but they were fun so hopefully it could have that same amount of the uh fun you know not every fighting game has to be like competitively like viable especially games like these these could just be for fun so mm-hmm. yeah hopefully hopefully it's a good time the combat looks fun it looks flashy and yeah um actually i'm looking forward to it now yeah, I'm still debating with myself if I'm going to buy it at full price because I think the next-gen versions for like PS5 and Xbox Series X, uh, I think those are 70 so I'm not oh sure. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, you know, what, what Sega's pulling here or whatever, but um, I might buy it at launch. I'm not entirely sure because I do want to play this when it, when it does come out. Uh, but these games go on sale very, very quickly, so I yeah. might just wait for that. Uh, but yeah, it's going to come out, uh, October 16th. So that is relatively soon. This game has been in development for a couple years, at least. I know that they've been showing or teasing this game, you know, on and off, but now that it is, you know, coming closer to release, you know, they're obviously dropping a lot more trailers and yeah, the game just, I just can't wait. That's all I can really say. (laughs) Yep, and now something not related to that. We got a <laughs> Spider-Man, uh, No Way Home. We got some like sort of like figures and pops and stuff, and it shows some uh, new looking suits here. So uh, we see one where I actually think that's the what was the other one? Far from Home. He has like the they had the web wings in that one. I actually don't remember. Actually, did uh, he? I believe so. At the end. At the end, right? Yeah. So he did yeah. have the web rings. <laughs> yeah, and then like they have another spider, another like pop Spider-Man that has like um, it looks like the Iron Spider suit a little bit. Yeah, as well. It's called then, the integrated suit. Oh, okay. And then we have some new ones as well, like sort of like a black suit, but like gold and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah. Uh. Again, these are probably are gonna be like the, the suits from the new movie. Uh, I actually don't remember they did this from Far From Home if they were like sort of like leaked ahead of time. Well, not leaked, but sort of like their, all their production, like all their, uh, what do you call it, merchandise was sort of like just leaked at that point because, you know, they got to make that shit. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, it looks pretty <laughs> interesting. You know, we also have, you know, they had the black and gold one that looks pretty neat and like sort of like his more classic suit, but it's like gold instead of like white or I guess black in that case. Um, yeah it it looks pretty interesting um again spider-man has had so many suits that's kind of hard to keep track of at this point Mm -hmm. you know it's not like the sam raimi ones where it's basically like the same suit the whole series except when it became the black suit you know i think the mcu ones definitely want to change it up a lot of time probably for merchandising (laughs) but um it's also nice to see like peter get new suits and stuff um you know even the amazing spider-man movies also changed his suit from one and two but that was probably for the best um (laughs) so yeah they they look pretty good uh you know i just want to see like what the hell this movie is going to be like we say every time we talk about this movie i'm like can they show a trailer (laughs) or something (laughs) can they drop a trailer one of these days they will yeah this movie has been so clouded and like confusion that i don't even know what to think anymore (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah i definitely agree but um, when these were initially leaked online last night, uh, it was like a Lego set and people saw the sort of like integrated suit with like the gold spider and everything. And people were like, this shit looks ugly. And like, I'm going to be honest, I was one of those people. I was like, I'm not a huge fan of the gold accents. Uh, but now that I'm looking at it, I'm like the Marvel Legend figure. Um, and, you know, it's been a day since I saw it. Uh, it's it's obviously uh sort of easing my mind a lot more like i'm okay with it um it's sort of like how i was with um when like they changed peter's face from the ps4 to the ps5 game um you know at first i was like "Ooh, what's that and then after a while i was like oh okay like i'm i'm okay with it now um but you know spider-man twitter you know like they're just they're just a bunch of a bunch of idiots along with everyone else that uses twitter including myself um (laughs) but you know i'm sure that there's a reason why the suit looks like this and you know just by looking at the pop it probably leaks some things about you know dr strange technology on his webs and stuff so you know that's obviously gonna play a part in the story and then the black and gold suit i'm not sure how that's gonna play into effect maybe it's like the uh the the new stealth suit but definitely uh they're sort of boxing themselves in a corner if they ever want to do the symbiote suit now because now they kind of have to go with the classic just full black suit and no sort of like accents on it or whatever but you know that's fine i'm okay with that if they ever do it eventually but like you said you know spider-man no way home we literally know nothing about this movie and there's been so much talk about like you know is is toby in it is andrew in it and i think that i'm not exactly sure if this was real but a fan met toby 
at like uh, one of the parks in New York and, you know, he asked him about No Way Home and he sort of just winked and smiled at him. And I'm like, I'm not exactly sure if that's true or if that actually happened or what the hell the, the deal is. Because, you know, there's obviously like no like good source on that because it's just this guy's word that, you know, he took a selfie with him. Um, but, you know, at this point, whenever that trailer drops, like it, it's going to break the Internet, obviously. And I'm sure Marvel and Sony know that both equally. Um, and the fact that this movie is supposed to come out in December and we're already in July, uh, you know, eventually they're going to drop something and we're going to find out more exactly concrete what the hell this movie is going to be about. <laughs> yeah, and I'm just excited to finally see it. You know, it's been it's been such a like mess of things. So I'm, I'm just going to be happy to see like, cause is, is Toby in there? <laughs> is he in there? <laughs> but yeah, um, it's going to be interesting to see when the movie actually comes out. And just kind of exciting for like, you know, it's going to be the first real big MCU thing. I know Black Widow is coming out, but you know, that movie has already been in production for a while. And like, and you know, I don't really count it as the next step. Like mm-hmm. it's, it's going to be exciting to see the um, next phase. And this is sort of be like the um, really big movie for that next phase for phase four. So yeah, I'm, I'm just excited for this movie to finally come out so we could stop speculating on what the hell is going to happen. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, people on Twitter could, you know, rest easy for a little bit and be like, oh, okay, now we actually know what's going on. But even then, I'm sure when the when that trailer drops, there's probably going to be a lot of, like, fake footage uh, and, you know, just, like, trailer-only footage because they do that every single time with these Marvel movies, no matter what Marvel movie it is. There's going to be trailer-only stuff. So even when that trailer comes out, there's still going to be some speculation and some mystery behind what this movie is about exactly but you know when that day comes we will definitely talk about it obviously Mm -hmm. all right so now let's get into our recent activities uh so i will let you go first because you know i got anime and i'll leave that to transition into demon slayer so (laughs) yeah so i I mean i also got anime i got two animes here Mm -hmm. uh i got jujutsu kaisen i finally watched it you know it's been like you know this has been out for a bit uh, I, I'm not, yeah, no, it's been out for a bit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I was just slacking on anime, honestly, because there's a lot of games coming out and stuff. So now that I start school again, you know, I could kind of, I kind of wind down on games, and I'm like, okay, I kind of just want to watch some things. So yeah, Jujutsu Kaisen was kind of like in my my backlog because I know a lot of people loved it, and yeah, it's re- really good. <laughs> Obviously, you know, there's a reason why people really, you know, people hyped it up so much, and you know, it's a big new shonen. Um, you know, I'd probably consider this one like the, what, like the second really. Well, I guess third one with my hero, my hero Demon Slayer, and this. I know like mm-hmm. Doctor Stone exists, but that's more of a lesser one <laughs> than mm-hmm. the other three. And this one is another like really good one that people say like it's very good. And yeah, basically it doesn't do anything new like Demon Slayer or, or my hero. Like they're both all just like basically what you expect from a shonen. You know, you got your powers. You know, you got your you know the jujutsu sorcerers and they fighting curses. You know, just like how you would expect any shonen to go. But again, it's very solid. Like you know, there's a reason why my hero and Demon Slayer are also really good because they don't really stray too far from the formula either they're pretty like by the books and how shonens work but they're just really good and yeah just mm-hmm. kind of basically the same way um though it does take a little bit of a darker turn you know it's a little darker to some like more violent scenes and stuff which is kind of cool but it does again it doesn't really do too much different there, there's some pretty interesting stuff in there though that kind of I, uh, I guess changes it from its like uh you know competitors with my hero and um demon slayer uh what i actually really like about this show is uh is the characters actually I, I, I ended up really liking them a lot more than i thought i would mm-hmm. uh you know the first half is mostly focused on like the main character and like gojo and stuff and like they do stuff you know like, i don't want to <laughs> say too much but yeah it doesn't really focus too much on any of the other characters so you know i wasn't really sure how i felt about them but the second half i'm like yo this is this is great like, i actually really ended up liking <laughs> a lot of the characters especially one character that's like amazing uh <laughs> you know it's he's really good um but yeah, I ended up really enjoying a lot of the cast. I think it's not as big as My Hero, but it's not or it's not as small as well. I guess not right now as Demon Slayer. I think it's gonna get bigger to Demon Slayer cast once we get to know more of the um, other Demon Slayer people. I forgot what they're called. <laughs> the, um, yeah, those. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when we get to know more of them. But I think you know it's a good middle ground, and I think everyone feels sort of important. Each like character has a moment to shine, especially the main trio. I actually really like the main trio in the show a lot, just like I did in Demon Slayer. I think they actually like 
really feel like friends and stuff and i think I always like appreciate that they don't feel like they're just there to be there like they actually do like kick a lot of ass which is nice mm-hmm. um you know the animation is fantastic i think i think this is why people were so excited for mappa to like do stuff because seeing this show i'm like holy shit like it's animated <laughs> so well like every fight scene looks really goddamn good and i don't think it hits the highest point of demon slayer with episode 19 but i think it's more consistent on how mm-hmm. hyped the fights are at least that's how i view it like i think demon slayer has that huge spike in episode 19 and the rest of the fights are really good as well but this show like i feel like each fight got me like extremely hype and there's a lot of them too like it doesn't really let up this show um I find the powers very interesting. It's a lot more uh, technical than some of the other shows. Like, you know, when they explain, like, curse energy and curse techniques and domain expansions, I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> but then I'm like, okay, I kind of get it now. It just kind of throws a lot at you in the beginning. Um, mm-hmm. Especially, like, Gojo's power. I'm like, what the hell is this? And then I, like, <laughs> I read about it. I'm like, okay, that's what it does? So, yeah, there's some really neat stuff. Really technical. And it kind of does take the shit off some other shonen where if they explain their technique, it gets stronger, which is hilarious to me mm-hmm. um but yeah it's, it's honestly a very interesting show i really like the concept of curses of sort of the um main antagonist since it takes a lot of the more i guess classical like i guess yokai type things or ghost stories from uh from japanese culture and stuff so i think that's a pretty neat concept for just as a main antagonist uh the main antagonists in general are pretty fun to be around as well you know they're pretty funny they're not as super serious as some of the other like you know like the league of villains or the um the other demon people from demon slayer and stuff so i think that's pretty neat whenever i see them on screen uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, overall, it's pretty good. Also, the humor actually made me laugh. Like, usually, I feel like anime humor is always kind of hit and miss for me. But I feel like this show constantly made me, like, chuckle. It, it was it was actually, the humor hit pretty good. Uh, so yeah, overall, I, I liked it a lot. You know, I didn't expect me to not like it, but I didn't expect myself to like it as much as I did. So I'm very much looking forward to, I think, the movie I think they're making. And then yeah. season two, whenever that comes out. So yeah, Jujutsu Kaisen, very good. You know, I'm pretty late on this, but <laughs> if you haven't watched it already, then definitely watch it. I think it's a very solid shonen and, you know, it's, it's very very good i'm enjoy i enjoyed it a lot um, and uh so, just oh, yeah. like quickly i think the creator of jujutsu kaisen he sort of like grew up on like other shonen so like naruto yeah. and like dragon ball so you can see that influence very clearly within jujutsu kaisen because he knows what makes a good shonen and he sort of brought that into his own uh for this uh anime slash manga and yeah i mean i definitely have to either read it or watch it again because i'm not you know i like i'm still like not 100 percent on the hype train of it like i can recognize that it is good but i'm not like you know 100 percent into it um but yeah Jujutsu kaisen is still like a worthy shonen to watch just because the fight scene the characters the humor everything that you mentioned was pretty spot on yeah i, I definitely think it's on the the higher level of them mm-hmm. I, I think it deserves a spot to be called like a one of the better shonens because you know at the end of this tier system like i said like doc rock over there dr stone is definitely <laughs> like a little bit of the mid tier and then you have things like um black clover that are a little lower than that i know it's gotten better but you know whatever <laughs> so i definitely consider this one of the, the upper tier ones so yeah i definitely recommend it if you liked uh things like demon slayer or my hero because it's 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 really good mm-hmm. uh next anime i'm starting to watch right now i'm only like seven episodes in right now it's uh code Geass, since i heard nothing but good things about it you know obviously it's a mech show i, li- I like me and my mechs uh but it's more like a political thing usually like real robot shows is what they call them i think what they call them is like more like the mechs are more just like soldier type things like the characters kind of just go in there there's not like Gurren Logan where they it's basically a shonen but we're robots it's not it's not like that it's more about the political drama and all that stuff and I, I love that type of stuff and yeah right now it's basically that um you know it's kind of like Death Note where the main character is very much you know like big brain like oh I hate society I'm gonna change everything <laughs> sort of like that I don't know why a lot of the anime that came out during that mid-2000s were very in on that um so because he but Lelouch basically feels a lot like Light does like like on how his like I guess um what you call it his aim is to change like the world and stuff uh but yeah it's pretty interesting so far you know a lot of characters and stuff i think the first episode goes like really fast like it's kind of hard to follow what the hell's going on in the first episode but it slows down a bit after that and really does explain what's actually going on since you know the first episode i feel like a lot of things are happening it's hard to keep track of but once you get that it's a, it's a pretty simple concept on like how this big 
empire is taking over the world and japan was one of them but there's like a big resistance in japan that doesn't want to be like conformed into that empire and lelouch the main character i don't think he's japanese but he like still hates the empire i think he was stationed there when he was young and he's like i hate this and i'm gonna change the world <laughs> and that's you know and things happen from there you know he has a pretty interesting power he gets right in the first episode where he was able to uh mind control people by just looking at them but i think he can only do it once or something to a person uh I, it's not too clear yet but um basically it makes it so he's able to like pretty much like change the system and how he goes and he uses his big brain to coordinate battles and stuff and it's for entertaining so i'm very interested to see where it goes from there obviously it's a big show with a bunch of characters and lore and stuff like that so i'm always interested in things like that so uh very interested to see where it goes from here uh i know season two gets a little whack but like the ending really saves it so <laughs> very interested looking forward to uh see how that works out but yeah, uh, besides that, I've also been playing some Metroid games since, you know, Metroid Dread got announced, and I was very interested in playing the other 2D Metroid games since they connect directly to Dread, obviously. So uh, Metroid Zero Mission, uh, by the way, I'm playing these on Wii U, but well, Super Metroid didn't, but I'm going to play Fusion on Wii U as well, since, uh, you know, the, the emulation of that is actually pretty good. Um, and right now, I think the Wii U is the only way you could play Super Metroid and Metroid Fusion, like, legitly. Because Nintendo is dumb and they're not on 3DS for some reason. Unless you have the Ambassador program and then you get mm -hmm. Fusion from the 3DS. But I kind of don't have that anymore. But anyway, Metroid Zero Mission. Uh, I think this is a great game to introduce anyone to Metroid. I think it does a good job showing you exactly where to go. Each major power-up is clearly marked on your map. Uh, you know, the game has a pretty clear progression path. And since this is a remake of an NES game, a lot of the level design is pretty simple. You know, obviously they changed it up a bit in Zero Mission to make it more like Super Metroid. You know, there's a lot of... Uh, quality of life you know obviously a map <laughs> the original game didn't even have a map uh you can aim in more directions uh uh you know the controls just feel a lot better um so yeah if you're gonna play the first metroid definitely play zero mission and it's it's very good you know obviously you collect power-ups as you go through uh the game is non-linear so you're able to do some things out of order but uh you know for the most part it, the game does feel a bit linear just because again this is a remake of an nes game so there's not too much they can really do with things so uh the game tries itself you know to go a little off the beaten path but uh for the most part you kind of want to follow where the game wants you to go else you won't be able to progress um but yeah for the most part it, it was really good uh really short it was only like four hours and a half uh well that's how much it took to beat uh to beat the game for me uh, I did 100%, and I only got like 70%, but I think that was enough. Uh, one of the issues I do have with the Metroid games is a lot of the collectibles are kind of just missile like uh, capsules, mm -hmm. and those don't really matter after a certain point. Once you have like over 100 of them, you don't really care. They're kind of just there to collect it and to get like that number up. So yeah, that's always kind of lame once you're kind of over getting all the energy tanks and stuff, and say, like, oh, only missile tanks are available, and like, oh, well, I don't really care. Uh, but yeah, for the most part, I think it's a great way to introduce you to Metroid. You know, the game isn't too hard. It's not too hard to know where to go. The game always points you in the right direction. The game looks great for a Game Boy Advance game. And yeah, it's just a good way to get your feet wet with Metroid. And yeah, again, it's not too long. So I think if anyone's really interested in the game, definitely pick it up. You know, obviously you're going to have a hard time playing it because it's only on Wii U legitly. But, you know, emulation exists. Use it if you have to. I definitely think it's a good way to uh, play the game. Uh, a game that's more easily accessible for everyone is Super Metroid, since that's on the Nintendo Switch online service. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, basically what people consider, like, the best Metroid game or one of the best games ever. And uh, I don't know if I agree with that fully, but it's very <laughs> good. Um, you know, I, I Zero Mission is obviously a nice, like, appetizer of what Metroid could be. This is a good, like, yeah, this is what Metroid really is. You know, the game is a lot more non-linear. The game doesn't really tell you where exactly to go, but I think the level design does a good enough job to sort of, like, push you in the right direction about outright saying this is where you should go so it does give you a lot more freedom to get things out of order you could do a lot of things like weird i got like super missiles pretty early you could do i don't know you just do a lot of different things out of order and this is like the freedom that a lot of people really like about metroid and i could definitely see how this game really excels at that you know you get a lot of things out of order and a lot of, like do some weird ass shit <laughs> to, um, <laughs> to make the gameplay interesting if you played it a bunch of times oh maybe i want to do this first and that first so yeah definitely a cool way to do like like progression and stuff and you know um after playing ori in the blind forest i could really appreciate metroidvanias because when i was a kid i've always hated metroidvanias so i'm like oh i don't want to backtrack or this is stupid but i think after playing ori I, my eyes definitely opened to being more open to these type of uh you know non-linear game design uh, especially if you have a good map. I think the map is a little more primitive than Zero Mission, obviously, because it was a Super NES game. But it does a great job telling you where items are and where to go. You just Obviously, it's up to you to figure out how to get the items. But every room has one. It has like a little square in it. So you know something is in there. 
Um, so yeah, for the most part, exp- uh, you know, rewards exploration. The music's fantastic. Um, just the production value for a Super NES game is, you know, just crazy. You know, there's a lot of like really cool atmospheric like moments in the game. Uh, I think the game tells a pretty good story while like no dialogue at all, which is always pretty interesting to see. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, just overall, it's a fantastic game. Highly recommend it to anyone that uh, wants to get into Metro. I also think this is a pretty good entry point, but I would probably recommend Zero Mission first, just because, again, like I said, it's more clear on where to go in that game, and you kind of get the idea what Metroid's about before you get into this game. Since this game is just a bit longer, it took me um, like six hours and 30 minutes to beat it. So yeah, it's a, it's a bit longer and a little more... Um, a little more complicated, but I definitely think it's worth a shot as well if you're into, uh, or if you want to get into Metroid. Uh, obviously, I need to play Fusion and the 3DS remake of 2. I'm saving that one for last since it's going to be the most, like, Dread. So I, mm-hmm. I kind of just want to save that for last so I already know what to expect with Dread. But yeah, so far so good. I'm really loving Metroid right now, and I'm very excited to play the other two 2D games and then play the Prime games whenever I get up to that. And then, last but not least, Mass Effect 3. Uh, last Mass Effect game of the three, obviously. <laughs> um, and so far, it's really good. Uh, honestly, it's a lot better than I thought it was going to be. You know, obviously, 3 has a lot of uh, controversy because of the ending. You know, there's a lot of things that happen. A lot, you know, the game was pretty rushed by EA to get the game out just so they had something for 2012, I think, this game came out. And they didn't want the game to be delayed for the next generation of consoles to come out because it came out 2013, those consoles, for mm-hmm. PS4 and Xbox One. Um, and there's some aspects of this game story that definitely feels rushed, but for the most part, I think they're doing pretty good. A lot of the big story arcs from Mass Effect 1 and 2 are wrapping up in this game, and I think they did really well. I think a lot of your decisions from 1 and 2 really do affect Mass Effect 3 in some big ways. Like, some characters would die, or some bad things would happen if you didn't do things properly in 1 and 2, which is really neat to see, like, all that sort of, like, webs of decision. Like, I could see where things could go wrong if I didn't save this person in 1, or if I didn't do this thing in 2. Like, it's just a really cool thing to see in action and kind of you know i could see what bioware was really aiming for when they made this whole trilogy and how ambitious it really was like what i did one of my favorite missions i did in this game where you had to cure a certain thing i don't want to say it because it's like spoiler but um (laughs) basically it takes a lot of things from mass effect one and two all those decisions all those people you helped into like a really big conclusion for this story arc i think they nailed it i thought it was fantastic so i thought that that's really neat but there are some story things to do rush um i think a lot of the human stuff feels kind of like not out of nowhere but definitely doesn't feel as developed in this game as it did in the first two games uh, especially the things with um a human faction called cerberus i think a lot of their stuff feels very rushed and not really well done so far and i heard it kind of gets worse by the end of the game which is probably where most of the um the complaints came from but as of right now i'm really enjoying the game really liking all the side missions the characters are fantastic in this game i think all the characters really like get their personalities in this game and like really shine and like have all their moments and stuff so yeah so far i'm loving it and i, I can't wait to go more and you know maybe get disappointed at the ending i don't know <laughs> yeah. can't wait to talk about that probably next podcast so yeah all right so everything i'm talking about is anime and manga related so uh my hero season five that is still going going into the next season all of anime but uh overall so far i like my hero still i mean i definitely like reading the manga more and i think that the reason is because i get to read it at my own pace and i don't have to you know wait for episodes to come out etc etc um but it's still crazy to me that they are still within their first year of high school that like everything that's been going on still i'm (laughs) like crazy yeah (laughs) i'm like wait they're actually like just gonna end school soon i'm like that is interesting um but yeah uh what they're doing with the anime i'm not gonna fully say it but they're doing something different from the manga they're pretty much like rearranging how the story is um so i guess i did say it but they're rearranging (laughs) how the arcs are and that did catch some heat on twitter me personally as a person that is a casual manga reader of my hero i'm not too you know i'm not going to be too heated about it uh the art that they are sort of moving around is kind of good uh so i'm sure that they are going to adapt that just later on and they just want to focus on deku uh todoroki and bakugo right now which is fine and i think that where that story is currently going is going to be fun and i the reason why i'm reading the my hero manga now is because they are skipping that arc so now i need to read up and sort of i guess get ahead of the anime again um so yeah it's been fun and i cannot wait to see uh what happens by the end of the season because i'm not sure if they're going to do the arc that they skipped by the end of it or if they're going to save that for season six or whatever but 
but yeah, My Hero is still good and worth watching. If you, you know, if you don't know, you know, My Hero is definitely one of the most normie shonen anime, but it is still good. It's just that my complaints with it is because it just has a lot of characters and Deku's not the best MC, but there's a lot of other things I could touch on with My Hero, but I won't get into that just yet. <laughs> it's still fun. I still enjoy it. It's just not the perfect shonen anime, if if you will. Um I started reading Your Name, Another Side, Earthbound. Uh, I'm That's reading a big title. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reading the light novel version. So pretty much this is a spinoff of Your Name uh, to sort of flesh out the other characters within the movie of Your Name. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's good. I've never read a light novel before, so it is definitely a lot more reading. But you do get more sort of like descriptive uh, sort of takes and sort of uh, have to paint a picture in your head of sort of what's going on within the story. I'm only halfway through the book. There's only four chapters. I'm only two out of four. But like within the chapters, they like split the chapters up into like four to five sections. So that's good for me. So like when I'm reading it on like my work break, I could like read one section of a chapter and then stop and then just, you know, chill out because, you know, I hate stopping in the, the middle of a sort of section and not knowing what's going to like sort of like forgetting what, what I've last read or whatever. So uh, obviously with manga and with the this light novel, there are, you know, chapters within the chapters. So it's a little weird, but it works. Uh, but yeah, I like it so far. Uh, I, I actually did purchase the manga version, so I'll definitely read that one after I finish this light novel version to go and see the differences. Uh, but yeah, if you like your name, I think that this is a sort of a side story worth reading. Uh, so far, so good. Uh, and then the other two anime that I finished watching because they are now done for this season uh, is After Being Rejected, I Shaved and Took in a High School Runaway and Don't Toy With Me, Miss Nagatoro. So the High School Runaway one, um, I think overall as like a sort of like romance slice of life, uh, I believe that those are the genres that it sort of falls under. Um, it's good. I'm not going to say that it's like amazing or anything like that. I've definitely watched a lot of, a lot of better ones. Um, but this one... Just because of its sort of like interesting twist and just like the name of it, it's definitely worth watching at least episode one. If you're not into it after that, you know, you can drop it or, or whatever. But, you know, n the characters, you know, most of them do change and sort of like, uh, but like no one changes like drastically where it's like, wait, this this character wasn't supposed to do that as far as like you could tell as like the viewer, if you will. Um, but it's wholesome. It's, it's cute. It's good. I think that... Um, you know, just from the name itself, you know, you you took in a high school runaway. You kind of want to see on how that all plays out. And I think that by the end of it, I was satisfied by how it went. Um, I'm not sure if the light novel is still... Oh, no. Okay. The light novel finished. I'm not sure if this anime adaptation adapted all of that, but I'm definitely going to have to do research on that to see if I need to read anything else. But um, it's, it's good. I definitely enjoyed it. Uh, don't toy with me, Miss Nagaturo. The best way I could describe this one is pretty much it's a bully manga with a girl teasing uh, her senpai, uh, which is a upperclassman within her high school. And this is pretty much a much more mature version of Teasing Master Tagaki-san, which is a anime slash manga series that I love. Um, and this one, uh, you know, obviously the characters are different. It's it's definitely clear that like they both like each other, but Nagaturo doesn't want to say that obviously uh but you know it's cute it's fun i think that uh after episode two you'll probably get a feel for like what the series actually is because straight off the bat nagatoro is is fucking mean like I, i'm gonna be honest like she is so mean and i'm like oh my god so like you know when i first started watching it i was like oh my god like i'm not sure if i can like you know keep it keep going because you know like she was like really really fucking harsh but like it's funny it's it, it, it has its cute romantic moments but you know i think that uh this is definitely the anime for this season in particular that i think a lot of people were watching and you know it it definitely lived up to my expectations personally especially since i started reading the manga and sort of caught and, and sort of got a little bit ahead of where this first season ended i'm sure that there's going to be a second season like come on um but yeah nagatoro is a good anime series and i definitely recommend it uh to anyone that likes i guess teasing romance slice of life comedy so <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> <laughs> all right 
So now let's talk about uh, the Demon Slayer movie now that it is finally out on digital because me and Damien did not go to theaters to watch it. No. Um, so as a person that read the manga, I want to know what your opinion is because, you know, I already knew what the hell was going to happen here. But, you know, just seeing it all animated and all beautifully done by UFO table was great, obviously. Also, we're going to talk about spoilers, just so you know. Um, mm-hmm. So I just want to know what were your thoughts on it, Damien? Uh, I really liked it. I actually thought it was actually a pretty good decision to make this a movie because I think it kind of fit pretty well. Like it seems like the arc wasn't that long to begin with, mm-hmm. so kind of fitting it into like a movie with like a higher production value seemed like a like a pretty good idea, honestly. Um, you know, um, if it was like in actual anime episodes, like I felt like it probably wouldn't like, I guess. Uh, you know it wouldn't be as long you know it would have been kind of awkward mm-hmm. to kind of place it into like a whole season too you know what i mean so yeah i think as a movie i thought it was actually pretty good like i think the structure worked well for a movie um uh, and i can't really think too much wrong with it i think all the sequences were like pretty good uh there's some cg that i thought was a little little you know <laughs> not great but for the most part i thought it was really good great action scenes you know some good um character development for like the new character that i'm forgetting his name but yeah he, it was it was pretty good you know you learn some more things about tanjiro and stuff and yeah for the most part it was pretty good i i really did like it yeah uh i just liked seeing it all animated obviously as a manga reader because you are right that it is not a very long arc. It, it it does only take up two volumes of the manga compared to season two, which definitely takes up more than two volumes of the manga. So I was yeah. definitely concerned when they were like, we might make another movie and adapt it from the anime stuff. And I'm like, please don't do that. Um, so I'm glad that they are going back to, you know, the sort of anime TV route. But anyways, uh, you know seeing rengoku on screen that was so much fun and seeing how he interacts with the other characters and seeing his backstory on screen you know i think that when i was reading it i was like rengoku you know like he's cool and then like when the movie came out obviously because of like literally the last scene where like everyone's fucking crying you know because rengoku left a huge impression on them um i guess people and audience members were just like really really in love with rengoku after that and I was like, oh, okay, like, I guess Rengoku's popular because, you know, they he was introduced within this movie and then he died by the end of it, which, you know, uh, was something that I didn't expect when I was reading it. I was like, oh, shit, like, this guy's actually dead. Like, what the hell? I forgot, you know, like, anime characters could die and shit um, <laughs> because, you know, I'm fucking out here reading all of all these romance slice of life, whatever. But, you know, seeing that happen and seeing that happen on screen and sort of like, those final moments of the movie you know it was definitely getting very emotional i didn't tear up i know that there's a lot of people that were in theaters straight up just crying and you know like that's just that's just what hit their emotional heartstrings but you know obviously i already knew what was gonna happen so um you know even even when i read that sort of like sequence i was like oh okay like you know this shit kind of crazy gotta be honest so but yeah uh seeing tanjiro and nezuko and all of them you know do their stuff and that was that was very fun as well so yeah i kind of like you know they reinforce that he's such a good boy tanjiro you know like it's like oh mm-hmm. even that this guy was like entering his like mind palace you're just like he's such a he's like letting me in man like i can't get you like <laughs> stab his like dream sphere thingy and then he kind of just stopped like i think that's a nice showcase to show that you know his character is pretty pure of heart and stuff and you know he's able to help people whenever he can but he's also again like i said when i talked about demon slayer the first time like he's not really a pushover either like he will do what it takes to like still kill the demon because they're still assholes about it Mm -hmm. but um you know he does enough to show mercy and stuff um but he's also like pretty hardcore to like save everyone i mean like the way he gets out of his own dreams by killing himself which is uh uh, (laughs) really cool uh you know there's a pretty metal way to do that um, and, you know, I think, uh, you know, Anosuke also gets a lot of time to shine as well as he helps him fight the uh, actual train demon. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, I thought he was a pretty interesting character. His power to make people fall asleep and then kind of just, you know, make them <laughs> sleep like that. It was cool. And the way he fuses himself with the train was also really cool. Like, that's a pretty cool, like, you know, way to make it so you won't just die immediately. Like, oh, I am the train. So you got to, like, cut the, my neck. That's a train. I thought, I thought that was a pretty <laughs> cool way to, like, you know, sort of, like, extend that fight. Uh, but that does kind of extend to my complaint. Like, really, my only complaint of it is the uh, the CG of, like, the weird train flesh didn't look that great to me. Like, you know, mm-hmm. I don't really complain that much about CG in anime because, like, I don't care for the most part. But when it's, like, a pretty big thing of the fight, it's kind of hard to not notice it. And I was just like, you probably could have done a bit better with that. <laughs> uh, but I was forgiven with the final fight, which, you know, definitely, uh, you know, maybe, like, forget about that. Um, 
and you know honestly it was actually pretty interesting when you know they actually did kill the train demon i'm like wait we still got a lot of the movie left <laughs> and i'm mm-hmm. like who the hell is gonna show up and then uh, obviously the final fight being one of those upper was like an upper three demon or something yeah i think it was uh, upper four maybe oh, upper i'm four. not entirely you, sure <laughs> yeah I, f- I forget uh fighting ren goku was uh was really good uh you know obviously it really i actually like this show shows like the how far behind tanjiro is like from everyone else like how mm-hmm. much more he has to learn and stuff because the uh the power ceiling is like huge like even like ren goku like he's like this like big old demon slayer guy can't even beat him like and he was already so far above uh tanjiro and now he's like oh now what <laughs> are we just screwed <laughs> like is he ever gonna win and like curious i thought that was a really actually a pretty powerful moment in the show because he's like man he's like so far behind everyone else and um yeah, it's just a, it was just a really interesting moment for his character too, and just like seeing everyone just fucking tear up and stuff because you know he's dead and like you know it feels kind of hopeless now. And you know when uh, the crow was telling everyone that he's he was dead it was also pretty good seeing the different reactions they all had. Um, but yeah, uh, basically he, he still went out like a badass. I think that fight was yes. really amazing. <laughs> you know, all the obviously they know how to animate a fight. You know, as we've seen with episode nineteen, I think it almost hits that level of like emotion and like just like animation wise, it was really good. Um, so yeah, it was just overall, it was just a really fantastic movie. Just a lot of fighting. You know, a lot of like good character moments for Ren Goku himself. You know, with his father being kind of like an asshole, and like you know mm-hmm. him telling his brother like, "Hey, you don't have to be a demon slayer to have like any worth and stuff. You can still just be you, and I, you know, I appreciate you and love you as a brother." And, ah, that was nice. <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of it's kind of sucks that he killed him, but it also made it a lot more impactful. Uh, I think they did a good job making you care about this character you just met. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. not a lot of shows could do that too well, but I think the show did it pretty well to like actually make you give a shit that this guy just died even though you just met him so you know he's just immediately likable so yeah overall i thought the the movie was really good and uh, i can't wait for season two (laughs) yeah i think that you know like what you're saying with tanjo you know my man's a good boy but on top of that my man's just straight up just killing himself every single time to wake himself up once he figured it out um and like the dream sequences like that was like the main thing that i wanted to see animated because uh you know like when i was reading the manga i was like oh, okay like obviously like this is a fucking dream like sh- shit's gonna go down and seeing every every one else's dream with like inosuke's and yeah. sinetsu like that shit was funny um and i think that inosuke him getting as much i guess time on screen really does help him as a character because i feel like out of the three you know inosuke was definitely he's obviously the crazy one and like he's the most chaotic but i think giving him the this much time within the movie uh just because of how the manga had it uh was very good and you know zinatsu there's probably gonna be a lot of people that love him and were probably upset that he wasn't in this movie as much but he does have that one moment on the train where you know he does fall asleep and then does that badass thing again um but you know he he already had that moment within the show so you know i think that um him being i guess not as prominent as the other two is fine um, but yeah, you know, Ren Goku, I think that because this was a movie and because of how short this arc was, you know, like you said, making it a movie definitely made sense because I think that making it into, I guess, like half a season probably wouldn't be the best idea. Um, and even then, like the pacing of this movie definitely felt right. Um, I don't think that it was too rushed or too slow. Um, I think that if it was a anime adaptation, it, it probably would have been a little slow. Um, but you know, because it was just like a straight up two hour movie with, you know, nonstop action, you get to see what happens next, like instantly and, you know, see this entire sort of arc just end from beginning to end, uh, you know, was very good. And I was very happy with how, you know, UFO table was able to deliver on the Mugen trade. And I cannot wait for, you know, demon, demon slayer fans to see what happens in season two, because I think that it only gets better from here in my opinion, but that's just, <laughs> manga reader knows that's, everything just now. that's just my fanboy of demon slayer saying, you know, but you know, Mugen train, I think that, you know, it was, it was very good. Yeah, I'd definitely say it was better than, like... Actually, you know, I'm of two minds of this. You know, obviously, it kind of sucks when the anime has an anime movie that's, like, important to the actual story because you actually Mm -hmm. have to go out and watch it. But I also feel like it's great because you get that extra production value and extra hype because it's a movie. 
and it progresses the story so it doesn't feel like you know pointless mm-hmm. uh the my hero movies don't really have that the my hero movies are basically are pointless but they look nice <laughs> but that's about <laughs> it you know the plot could vary obviously as we we've seen with the other two mm-hmm. uh but again it looks nice i think this one had the benefit of be- both looking nice and being like an actual important arc to the story because you know it, it progresses the thing forward um and it's kind of hard to see which one i prefer i, I definitely prefer something like demon slayer just because, you know, I, I actually care what's going to happen in the movie. You know what I mean? There's mm-hmm. no like, oh, this is obviously like a movie villain. So I don't really care what's going <laughs> to happen. Uh, it's kind of actually why I really liked um, uh, Battle of the Gods for Dragon Ball Z. Since it actually moved the plot forward from, you know, Z to Super. Which was really cool as well. And I ended up really liking that movie a lot. So, um, yeah, I usually prefer anime movies when they're like this. But I also get the arguments like, oh, now you have to like either go out and, you know, watch the movie in the theater which you know some people can't do and especially when it was covid you know made mm-hmm. it very difficult for people to do but also like oh if they don't put it on any streaming service like you have to just like you know buy the blu-ray or just pirate it at that point so yeah i could definitely see why that would also be upsetting for some people but for the most part i think they did a great job with this movie you know animation was fantastic i think i also think it was perfectly paced you know and it didn't felt too fast too slow it felt just right and yeah i think they really nailed the movie so yeah uh i think that you know making it canon to the manga is fine. I think that I'm definitely more a fan of, uh, you know, canon actual like stories or like something that ties back to the anime in some way. Um, because, you know, with the My Hero movies, you know, the first one was fine because it was just like harmless. Yeah, the first one was all right. Yeah. yeah, it was harmless filler. The second one, you know, it looked really cool. I'm going to be honest, you know, like the the last act of the second movie, whew, like yeah. that that was really good but like the story wise i was like what the fuck is going on now like yeah <laughs> but you know it is what it is we're not gonna spoil that one uh to anyone that still wants to watch those movies um but you know mugen train i'm glad that you know it it was as good as i expected it to be you know despite me knowing exactly what was going to happen and, and everything but i knew that you know ufo table you know they were not going to disappoint with this one because they knew what the stakes were they knew how popular demon slayer was and you know because this was a movie and there was an actual budget uh you know they they were able to deliver despite you know some of the cg but you know cg in anime is always something that isn't going to be a hundred percent good um but yeah <laughs> But yeah, really good. You know, if you haven't watched it, watch it. <laughs> exactly. All right. So Loki. Now we're gonna talk about Loki. Uh, episode three and four. We're also gonna talk about spoilers. So you know, if you don't want to be spoiled for this Disney Plus show, you should probably stop listening to us. But if you don't care, you know, keep going. Uh, so we're just gonna talk about like what just happened within both of these episodes. If you remember, obviously, like sp- specific things, bring them up. Um. So. Uh, you know sylvie as the female loki and loki yeah. i guess falling in love with her or whatever yeah. um that shit is very interesting but yeah. also like it makes sense for loki because yeah. my man's a fucking egomaniac uh, that's what i was gonna say so this is actually when we were talking about ratchet and clank Rift apart right remember how i said I'm like yo that'd be really weird if ratchet likes rivet because i'm like that's himself <laughs> but with loki it makes sense because he's a giant narcissist so i'm like that that does make sense why he would just love himself that much you know what i mean so mm-hmm. uh, it's honestly in character and they kind of make fun of it too it's like wow you really are a big old narcissist you love yourself i can't believe mm-hmm. it so yeah i think i honestly think it's unfitting for his character to just fall in love with himself uh but i also really like sylvia as a character as well obviously she's just loki but like you know female loki and but she has enough of her own identity to like stand as her own character you know she went through a lot of stuff uh you know that they went over in episode four mm-hmm. um but, you know, in episode three, uh, you know, Loki and her are kind of just getting to know each other because they're in the, the planet that's exploding, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you know, to kind of just, you know, Loki kind of just put them into that doomsday planet and, you know, them trying to find a way to get out of there to just start to learn more about each other and start to like each other more. You know, like basically, you know, they're not so different, you and I, because they're literally the same person. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I thought that was pretty interesting. You know, I wasn't really sure what they were going to do with this female Loki or Sylvie. Uh, but right now, I'm, I'm kind of like what they're doing with her. You know, she's a more competent Loki. You know, she kind of knows more what she's doing. You know, our Loki, or I guess uh, any like Loki we know is going to be a little more of a like a derp, you know, not like uh, she is. <laughs> so she definitely seems to know more of what she's doing than he does. So. Yeah, and I think that, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to look at this from, like, a fucking political angle because people are going to be like, oh, 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 you know, like, fucking women, you know, like, oh, no. <laughs> you know, she, like, changed her name and, like, she's, like, empowered her. And I'm like, I mean, that's fine. Like, that's just, you know, how this character is. And I'm sure that there's probably someone on Twitter and someone on YouTube that already made a video 
about this because there's always one of those fucking like white YouTubers that just like says some shit about, you know, whether it was about Wonder Woman or Black Widow or whatever right. the fuck. But, um, you know, Sylvie, I think that her as a character, you know, obviously she, she, she complimented Loki because they are literally the same fucking character or like the same person, quote unquote. But like she obviously changed her name. She doesn't like being called Loki. She doesn't like being called Variant. She has her own story about how she's always been on the run because she doesn't, she wasn't supposed to exist, quote unquote. Yeah. And I think that everything about this show has been super interesting and these two episodes really peak at that. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, I am just excited to see what happens in episode five, just to, like not get ahead of anything. But yeah, I am I'm very, very happy with how, you know, they've handled Loki and also introducing Sylvie and everything like that. Um my favorite moment from uh episode four, or maybe not favorite, but you know, the moment that really they caught me off guard was when, you know, when Mobius and like the other uh Hunter person was like figuring out that like they're all variants and they weren't created by the timekeepers or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then they figure out that like, oh shit, like wait, I had a I had a life before this. And then, you know, Mobius starts, you know, snooping around in whatever, and then you know, he's like, I right, Loki, let's fucking do this shit. And then he dies, and I'm like, what yeah. the the fuck like that like that moment right then and there because i forget because you know all of the marvel things that that we've watched no one's really died quote unquote so like seeing a character that like you know i sort of like grew attachment to and sort of liked you know because he's been there since episode one you know mobius he died and i was like shit what the fuck but like he also probably didn't die because you know what we see in the after credit scene with loki when he quote unquote dies and shit like that so we'll probably see him again hopefully i hope but definitely that moment was was uh the highlight for me <laughs> yeah de- definitely like a shocking moment because like you said they don't really like kill anyone in these shows now, obviously the mcu kills people but not like these shows haven't really done that so yeah seeing mm-hmm. that I was like what the hell they just killed him <laughs> <laughs> so I-, I really do like the conspiracy like uh angle of this show like you know oh something's wrong with the tva and things aren't like how they seem and stuff like i i've been really enjoying that and seeing how they have to um sort of like bring down this whole like system you know like uh, with the mm-hmm. timekeepers and stuff which we learn later in episode four that aren't even real <laughs> so like yeah so um <laughs> there's gonna be very interesting who's actually pulling the strings of the tva and why this was even created in the first place and you know hopefully they all the other i guess the variants inside the tva as in the whole tva is able mm-hmm. to like remember their past lives and stuff you know also like it's actually cool foreshadowing with uh mobius when he said you know i always want to own a jet ski or whatever and then in this episode oh maybe i did have one <laughs> in my own life you know <laughs> so uh, you know that's pretty interesting stuff that they right thrown in like i think that was like an episode one when he said that so that was pretty mm-hmm. neat as well um and yeah just you know we just learned that tv are kind of just assholes in general again with um selfie was it selfie selfie sylvie <laughs> uh, sylvie yeah sylvie uh, when she was a child, again, she wasn't supposed to exist, I guess, because I don't know if female Lokis are supposed to exist. And she was just taken from her home, even though she was like a kid, and then she was on the run ever since. So that also just shows that the TVA aren't exactly like good guys in general either. Or competent. Um, and- like, how did this kid do that, by the way? I'm just saying, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't worry about that. Um, <laughs> and also how they uh, they cover up the death of the other girl. I forgot what her name was. The other, uh-huh, uh, the uh, quote unquote death. I'm sure she's not dead. Uh, like yeah, she just like lost either. her mind or whatever. And they were like, "Ah, right, yeah, yeah. We gotta say that she's dead, so like she doesn't like leak this shit." But she leaked it. Yeah, and um, you know, it, again, it just shows that the conspiracy runs really deep in here. And like now that the timekeepers aren't e- even really like a real form of power is going to be really interesting to see like who actually is in charge of this whole thing and it's also interesting like you said before that the uh that weird stun thing that kills people doesn't maybe kill people probably just puts them in their own like little like time dimension i guess like obviously at the mid credits we saw loki with a bunch of other lokis Mm -hmm. so uh yeah so that's gonna be the interesting to see where mobius ended up and maybe he's also not dead but um yeah, we we have to see because I I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, the, I I can definitely see why Kevin Feige or whoever said it was like this is gonna be like the most impactful show on the MCU, and like I think we're definitely seeing that after Episode Four, and you know with Sylvie and the Lokis and everything like that, I. I am very much enjoying this show, and I think that a lot of people can agree that like this is probably the best MCU show so far. I'm I'm gonna hold my sort of take on that and sort of be like, this is a very good MCU show. Um, but yeah, definitely with, uh, you know, Sylvie and Loki when they were, I guess like 
sharing their last moment with each other and then it sort of like diverged the timeline or whatever i was like oh shit like that's not that's obviously not supposed to happen so obviously there are i guess mutual feelings there and we're probably going to see on how that all plays out and also i guess like the quick line where like they or where like sylvie threw out like do you have a princess or a prince and then you know i uh, i saw like an article on like one of those like comic book sites that like i guess this confirms loki's bisexual which i'm like hey you know like that's cool you know uh, you yeah know, i mean that that really doesn't surprise me because a lot of people in like you know asgard is obviously like based on like norse so like ancient times and everyone was bi during this time i don't know why people <laughs> didn't think that like the romans were like doing shit also the greeks like i don't know why people think this is like a big like uh surprise you know what i mean i'm like mm-hmm. yeah that you probably should be bi and like that's gonna be the case <laughs> so that's good though you know obviously that's good representation and stuff like, even if it was mm-hmm. just like one line you know kind of just just confirm that you know loki doesn't give a shit oh <laughs> uh, so. yeah i mean i guess it fits with this character my man does not give a fuck about anything um and you know last month was pride month but pride month's every month for me just saying anyways um (laughs) you know so far so good with the loki show i am very much enjoying it and uh yeah i mean i don't think there's much else i can really say there's probably a couple moments that i'm missing but i really like just overall like episode three and four is definitely like peak for this show just because episode three was very much about loki and sylvie sort of bonding together and sort of figuring out who they are uh you know like as themselves because you know we obviously don't know anything about sylvie but also you know loki's still trying to discover who he is um and then episode four is very much about like discovering what the the tva is and you know who's behind everything as you put it earlier so yeah and um also what just one more thing that um that really impressed me with the show is just how much production's in it like Mm -hmm. just putting that whole all everyone in like that big you know just like in like that weird planet just the TVA in general, like, there's a lot of, like, set design and, like, CGI they had to use, and it all looks really great. Like, I think, like, the show just looks really good. Like, you could just make this as a movie, and, like, I, I probably wouldn't tell the difference. Obviously, it might be a little lower quality than, like, an actual MCU movie, but mm-hmm. for the most part, it looks really good. You know, obviously, the last two shows were more, you know, set in, like, reality. I know WandaVision was more, like, <laughs> TV stuff, but you know what I mean. Like, it's more, yeah. like, still, like, pretty normal stuff. Like, this one goes a lot crazier with its sci-fi stuff, so uh, definitely really cool to see that whenever, like, they go into a crazy new place um but yeah overall really good you know i'm really interested to see the ramifications that this show is going to have for the rest of the mcu i I mean i'm i'm still betting that the timelines are just going to split forever at this point and it's going to be some weird (laughs) shit but uh, i guess we're gonna have to see that i don't see this ending with just having a singular timeline anymore um or Or with the uh, tva still standing (laughs) yeah the tva is also probably going to go away that way they could just be like you know since they introduced the tva everyone's like oh why did the tva just allow thanos to kill everyone that's kind of messed up so they're probably just gonna like erase the tva so people don't ask that for future things but i guess we'll see uh really interested to see how this is gonna go i'm, I'm very excited for uh the rest of the i think it's two more episodes right uh yeah which is kind of crazy so yeah kind of crazy <laughs> these next two episodes better bang on like wandavision you know it kind of yeah. <laughs> kind of peaked and then it kind of dropped but i'm i'm betting that loki is only going to get better with the last two which we'll talk about in the next episode but uh now we'll talk about mario golf uh so this is a game that i kind of just bought because i was like well it comes out today so i was like i might as well go get it so uh have you played any like other mario golf games before no this is my only mario golf game i've played yeah big same i mean we've both played other mario sports games i'm, yeah. I'm sure a, a personal favorite of ours is like mario hoops 3 on 3 fucking love that game <laughs> this is some other ones um the mario tennis game that came out on the switch uh i forget what it was called exactly like but that aces? one yes yeah. mario tennis aces um that one was good it's just that uh over a period of time it sort of felt like a fighting game because of just how the gameplay played out (laughs) um but i still think that it's a good mario mario sports game in general but i think that uh you know there could have been some leeway with that because mario sports games are supposed to be made for fun you know so um you know hopefully the next one that they do with strikers but you know uh mario golf super rush uh is very fun i mean i've only played the adventure mode for like uh four hours maybe uh how how much have you played since the last time uh, we talked <laughs> you, you played more than me i was just messing around with the other modes like that not an adventure mode oh uh, okay I, I was i was interested to see how those were like so i'm still only finished like i, I was up to the mission i saw you were doing that's where i'm mm-hmm. up to okay so. yeah 
that mission's fucked up. I don't even know yeah. how to. <laughs> I, don't, okay. I don't even know how I'm gonna beat that. So like, pretty much the mission that I'm referring to is like where you have to get your, where you have to pretty much score in all of these holes within like a certain time limit. But they're like scattered across the map, so you have to like plan out how you're gonna do it. But I think I'm like under leveled or like underpowered or whatever, so I'm just like struggling to like get this shit done. And I haven't played it in a week because of that. So, but also <laughs> because of work. Um, but yeah, I mean, overall, just like the mechanics of Mario Golf is like very fun. I, I was very surprised by how much I was getting into it, to be honest. You know, like we've played uh, golf with golf your friends. friends. Yeah. Uh-huh. So like I was familiar with how golf worked, uh, but now I like kind of know on how like golf scoring works and all of this other stuff. Um, but, you know, just like learning the mechanics of Mario Super Rush and the main way that you play in adventure mode is, I believe, speed golf. So yeah, like speed golf, yeah. you hit it and then you run after the ball which is fun because you know you get to pick up these like speed up power ups or whatever and you also get to push your opponent sometimes which i haven't done yet but i have kicked the ball to like screw the uh, cpus over which is kind of <laughs> funny um but yeah overall i am having a lot of fun with mario golf just from like the little bit that i that i played of it yeah no i feel the same way so again i know some people are complaining because uh lack of content or comparing it to the other mario golf game on gamecube again both of us have never played that so i have nothing to reference to Mm -hmm. Uh, but from just as my first mario golf game i think it's really fun like i think again the adventure mode is pretty fun to dice you know show show you how the game works uh you know obviously the game is also just fun in general just for the adventure mode and stuff but the other modes are also a lot of fun obviously there's normal golf where you just play as normal golf like you hit the ball and then you instantly teleport to it you know just like a normal golf game but again Mm -hmm. the speed golf is a lot of fun as well you do like the whole super dash thing and you can knock people's balls around and you could like hit them with your super (laughs) dash as well which is fun you know really mess with everyone and the later courses actually are are, like get a little difficult to navigate so like actually have to like try to like navigate more carefully like there's more obstacles in the way like um like pokies or like those things from mario 3d world which is pretty cool as well like they definitely try to make it hard to actually get to the ball as well which is pretty (laughs) um you know the other mo- i haven't actually tried battle golf yet uh like where it's like basically like the mario kart battle mode but with golf instead where if you hit a ball into the hole i think the hole changes for everyone else so like you have to move to the, to the next oh, one I, I that sounds chaotic. fucked up i'm gonna be yeah, honest <laughs> so I, haven't, I haven't tried that yet but i have tried some of the other ones like i have tried a, a speed golf where the time is like the major factor so it's like how how good your time is and if you go over par you get like a time penalty and if you get like bogeys and stuff or if you get you know was it birdies yeah i think that's the mm-hmm. good one <laughs> i can't remember you get you get like time off your time and shit so it, it's pretty fun as well um i don't know if you play with special shots either those are pretty fun as well where if you get enough holes you will get like a you have like a meter basically above your score or under mm-hmm. your score i should say and each character has a special one so like luigi would like freeze the ground below his ball and i think that messes with people uh booze is fucked up like his special <laughs> shot will, or um any ball in the area the ball will like curve like immensely like you can't like aim straight at all and so annoying uh but that's also pretty fun this is another cool little layer of wackiness and like strategy you could apply to the golf as well um and it's kind of interesting to just have actual golf mechanics like i said i played a, a lot of golf with your friends i have like 50 hours in that game so i don't know how to play like that type of golf like mini golf like arcadey stuff but this one yeah i count for like the wind and like uphill and downhill stuff and it does add mm-hmm. another layer of like strategy to like how things work and i actually find it a lot of fun like i didn't expect myself to have as much fun as i was so yeah it's definitely like a lot of fun i, I can't really complain about the lack of content because I, I don't know <laughs> like i don't really know what <laughs> what's the right amount of content for this type of game and it is getting free updates which i know it's like it probably should have been in the game in the begin with but it is getting stuff like new donk city i think they already showed so uh but so far i i am really liking it a lot it's a, it's a ton of fun yeah uh i just want to play more of it but you know work has been killing me and i've been oh, yeah. <laughs> consuming other content but you know mario golf super rush is definitely something that i uh, I'm going to try to at least finish by next week and hopefully get a video on it. But, you know, if not, I'll I'll get a video on it eventually, hopefully. Um, but, you know, times the time will tell uh, because this is definitely a Mario sports game that I did not expect myself to have as much fun as it is because, you know, it's 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 goddamn golf. Whenever you mention golf to anyone, it they're probably they're, they're, one of their first thoughts is either boring or like super fun. 
one or the other. <laughs> Basically, um, I love golf games. I just don't mm-hmm. like golf. Uh, in general. Yeah. So, you know, this one definitely surprised me uh, with how much fun and how much, uh, I guess, investment that I was actually having when I was doing the adventure mode stuff with my me and all that other bullshit. But, you know, definitely Mario Golf Super Rush is something that I think that everyone should at least give a shot, you know, um, no pun intended, um, <laughs> you know, rent it on Gamefly or something like that or maybe borrow it from a friend if you have one of those um that i actually bought the game uh but yeah i think that this is definitely uh, a mario sports game that should not be overlooked in my opinion uh but i hope that other mario sports games are in the works maybe a mario strikers game like i mentioned earlier because that one is goaded uh when it comes to mario sports games in my opinion it's literally just soccer with like power-ups like th- there's no way you can mess that up but you know We'll just have to wait and see because I know that Nintendo probably has a bunch of other Mario spinoff games in the works right now. So I just want another Mario Hoops 2 on 3. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that too, that wouldn't be that bad. I think the last time Mario did basketball, anything was like Sports Mix on the Wii, which yeah. I haven't played. Um, but it, see, that's confusing because both of those games were made by Square for some reason. Like the ones that <laughs> made, um, though, I, I don't know who made Strikers, but I know the ones that made tennis and golf are Camelot, and I know they do a lot of the sports games now. But still, mm-hmm. I, I would like another, uh, like Hoops 2 on 3 or something. That would be a bunch of fun. Yeah. But is there anything else you like to say, Damien? Um, no, I think that's it. All right. So thank you guys for listening to this episode of the Travis and Damien podcast. And we will see you guys two weeks from now with another episode. Later.